We'll call on the Committee on Facilities and Capital Planning to order. I declare that a quorum of the members is present and that the media has been given proper notice under FOIA. The first agenda item is Inclement Weather Makeup Day 2017-2018. Mr. Jackson, you're recognized. Greetings, Chairman McQuillan, board members, Dr. Ingram. Um, As noted, um, talking about the inclement weather day for this year, uh, due to the threat of Hurricane Irma in the fall, uh, we lost three instructional days, September 8th, September 11th, and September 12th. Uh, the district opted to use each of the three weather makeup days that were um, established on this year's instructional calendar. Uh, January snowstorm led to another loss of an instructional day. Uh, to resolve this matter, the district uh, would need to add an instructional day to the month of June, um, select a day during the weekend to make that day up, or the board may exercise their authority to waive uh, the lost instructional day uh, from January. Uh, due to uh, it's the opinion of the administration that adding uh, a day to the end of the school year in June um, may not be beneficial to the students. Um, adding a day during the weekend um, may not be feasible. Yes, ma'am. Or popular. Or, or, or popular. Um, <laughs> therefore, it is the recommendation of the administration that the board waive the lost instructional day that was lost in uh, January 9th of 2018 due to the snowstorm. We have a motion. Mr. Chair, I make a motion to accept the recommendation of administration to waive the instructional day missed in January due to inclement weather. Second. We've got a motion and a second. All in favor, please respond by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes three to zero. Okay, moving to 2B. Mr. Jackson, you're recognized for the instructional calendar 2018-2019. Yes, sir. During the, uh, the busy spring of 2016-17 school year, the administration presented two instructional calendars, one for the 17-18 school year that we're currently in and another for the 18-19 school year, which is next year. The board approved both. Um, upon review of the 2018-2019 instructional calendar, it was noticed that November 6th uh, was used as an instructional day. And November 6th is also an election day, an even year election, uh, which is also known as a general election. Uh, by South Carolina law, we're not permitted to use um, that day as an instructional day, nor a work day, et cetera. Um, the administration is recommending uh, that we make an adjustment to the 1819 calendar to reflect the closure of schools on November 6, 2018, and add um, in the addition of an instructional day on April 22nd, 2019, uh, which is currently uh, an extension of, of, of spring break. Um, and also an inclement weather day. We would use that day as an instructional day. In January 7th, uh, 2000, excuse me, 2019 would then serve as one of the three required inclement weather makeup days. Do we have a motion? Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve an adjustment to the 2018-2019 instructional calendar to reflect the closure of schools on November 6, 2018, and the addition of an instructional day on April 22, 2019. January 7, 2019 will then serve as one of the three required inclement weather makeup days. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Is, Go ahead. I'm sorry. You're trying to hustle us on. Is January 7th a teacher work day? I know we got some feedback about inclement weather days being teacher work days. Did we solve that problem with this different date, or is it also a teacher work day? Well, we, we <coughs> thought we solved the problem uh, by using April 22nd. Um, however, since we're having to use that as an instructional day, yes, January 7th is teacher a teacher. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor, please respond by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes three to zero. Um, we'll next move to an information item on the agenda, the quarterly construction update. Mr. Jackson. Yes, sir. Ms. McQuillan, at this time, I'd like to invite Mr. Gene Sides um, to the podium to deliver our capital projects.
board members, uh, Madam Chair, Dr. Ingram, this is your quarterly construction update. Uh, it's going to be somewhat sweet because we're only going to talk about three projects because the others are complete. Um, as you can see, the Berkeley Ed Center is scheduled to begin next month, or in, I think it's the 1st of April. And then we have Fox Bank and Bowens Corner that are scheduled to be completed in August for the start of the new school year. Uh, this is just a recap of the Berkeley Ed Center that was currently, the GMP was currently passed at last month's uh, meetings. This is the, basically the stabilized building itself from phase one. And these are conceptual uh, drawings and ideas for the interior for the phase two that was approved last, last month. Can you speak in the microphone? Oh, I think I've shot too many shotguns and oh, can't hear those okay. here. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, right now we're just going through some scrubbing of the construction uh, of the uh, estimates just to make sure that we have everything in order as to what what we need to execute on this on this particular project. And these are just some conceptual departmental and conference room type of uh, spaces. Still can't. Okay. On uh, this is Bowen's Corner. It's uh, on schedule. The uh, we are in both projects for Fox Bank and Bowen's Corner. We're kind of in the massing phase, um, where the building is beginning to take shape. You'll be able to identify some of the areas with the roof shapes and the uh, the massing of the building. Uh, as you can see, this is the kindergartens and first grades are identified with areas A1 and A2, and area C is the multi-purpose kitchen and dining and music rooms. Currently, the activities are the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing uh, rough ends and sprinkler rough ends are going in on the second floor. Structural steel is still is being installed on the central stairs. Uh, metal wall framing in between the classrooms with uh, conduit and electrical as well as plumbing are being implemented at this time and the underground rough ends are in progress for the kitchen and serving lines in addition to this when weather permits we're getting our uh, parking lot storm drainage installation going on and these are just a few of the progress this is a cooling tower in the upper left corner that was just recently uh, installed and then you have the massing of the uh, classrooms in the cafeteria courtyard area at Fox Bank, uh, as stated with Bowen's Corner, as long as weather permits, we're moving forward. As you can see, this is a rear view. Uh, Fox Bank Plantation Drive is at the top of the photo. Uh, cafeteria is at the back, which has the roof on it. And then you have your classroom wings on both sides. And where the main entry is, that's your media center main entry foyer. Uh, as the current activities are, they're very similar to uh, Bowen's Corner. The mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire sprinkler rough ends are in progress on the first floor, as well as they're starting on the second floor. Uh, CMU installation is in progress in the uh, area A on the second floor, which is the second and third grades, I believe. And then we have metal for, metal, hollow, hollow metal door frame installation in progress on the second levels. The rest of the buildings have their metal door frames in, in place. We started brick veneer installation last week, as you can see in the lower right corner. Um, we're constant, trying to concentrate on the CMU installation at this time to get so that we can start getting a roof framing started. We've also got cable tray installation, as you can see in the top right photograph and then we're starting to begin our site preparation for roadways and parking lots and bus bus avenues and then the light gauge metal trusses which is what we're trying to accomplish this week and next week if weather would allow us to which it hasn't been very cooperative um, we hope to get those installed by the end of next week with the window frame installation but the inclement weather impacts what we've done there is we've uh, executed acceleration in the masons uh, schedule so that he can hire more labor force to complete the second floor walls and these are just a few of the progress this is a as you can tell by the site conditions it's extremely wet um, the front of the uh, school is in the top right and then you have basically just some progress and 
system wall system type photos in the lower left of how the CMU and the insulation and brick are applied with the multi-purpose room is in the middle and that's pretty much it so are there any questions any questions all right moving on to the next agenda item facilities master plan update mr. Jackson Sir, if you would give me just a second. Oh. Yes, sir. So, um, <clears throat> During the summer, early fall of last year, the board made a critical decision to engage in an in-house uh, facility assessment plan or facilities master plan. Um, we talked a lot about growth um, over the past few years. We talked a lot about growth um, and the impact that it's having on our surrounding area and the impact that it's having on the school district. Uh, we talked about the number of schools that you know, the district is projected to need in the future. Um, we uh, mentioned um, the amount of maintenance or upkeep that would be required for the existing facility. So what the facilities master plan is designed to do uh, is develop an efficient and reliable assessment to address our facility needs now and uh, in a sense be able to predict the future. Um, in the process of doing so, um, we'll develop a progressive uh, six-year facilities assessment master plan that would be used uh, to help us, again, predict the future growth um, and um, address our development changes, challenges, excuse me. So some of the major components uh, to this plan is uh, the board may also made a decision to retain the services of Harding Parker and Associates, um, use their expertise and, and um, experience in helping to uh, facilitate and develop this master plan. We've also contracted with uh, Numerics. Um, their role in this uh, in this process is help us to develop, um, uh, predict our future facility needs based on our growth and enrollment. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on in the presentation. Um, our educational adequacy assessment, um, Harding Park and Associates will also play a role uh, when establishing uh, that educational adequacy assessment. Um, one of the most critical components to um, developing this plan is the assessment of existing facilities. And for that, we used in-house staff, um, uh, Mr. David Hogue and Mr. Wayne Evans. Uh, gentlemen, if you could, could you stand up and actually join me because um, I'm going to do the introduction and they're going to get into the meat of um, what this report or what this, uh, this plan will actually look like. So gentlemen, if you could come up, that would be great. And then also the life cycle maintenance or predictive cost forecasting. So what all of this is going to do when it's all put together, it's going to give us, um, again, a comprehensive facility um, f assessment plan, and it will allow us to plan for large expenditures uh, in the future, major systems, uh, building envelopes, uh, roofing, et cetera, um, with the educational adequacy assessment will allow us to determine uh, when and where augmentations to existing facilities are needed. Mention numerics. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Mr. Mike Smith um, is with numerics. Um, Mr. Mike Smith actually has experience working with Berkeley County. In 2009, uh, the district did um, a, a growth assessment um, you know, as, as we were experiencing growth. Um, Mr. Smith was with uh, ORED back then, uh, so he has experience uh, with Berkeley County, he did the 2009 study as well as uh, the 2011 update to it. Um, Mr. Smith is now local, um, so he's a Charleston-based company now. Um, so he's experiencing the growth firsthand just like we are. So previously, uh, previously for demographic services, we had contracted those out uh, to a, a firm that was out of state. Um, it's not as familiar uh, with 
uh, the type of growth that we were experiencing, growth and development that we were experiencing, and, and quite honestly had to mobilize any any time that we needed uh, the firm to come to our area. So that's one that's one major benefit that we have by um, by having Mr. Smith um, here local with us. Want to explain a little bit more? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Miller. Mike Miller. That's, right. that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll just briefly talk about uh, some of my experiences and what I'm seeing and my place in this in this uh, in this project. Uh, I'm the one that is responsible for the membership forecasts and using that information, determining where new facilities might best meet the needs of a growing county, and uh, eventually looking at how attendance boundaries and student balance figure into this. Um, the tools I use are primarily GIS based, which means that it's not just a, a table of uh, membership numbers getting larger and larger every year. We actually can look at individual neighborhoods and determine uh, the potential, the growth potential of a new neighborhood or a new development that's just on the ground using the information from history that we uh, is already in the database. So when all this uh, data gets uh, put together, we create a membership forecast that helps you address your pressing capacity needs with new facilities and new attendance boundaries. You'll hear a lot more detail later on, but that's enough for tonight, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Um, and we mentioned um, Harding Park and Associates, and um, the associate working with us is actually Dr. Parker um, working with the working with us on the complete plan. But also, uh, we'll be doing the educational adequacy assessment, and we're all we're already um, kind of getting a, a head start on that portion and trying to determine how we could best use um, our facilities as they're standing now and use them more efficiently. Dr. Parker, would you like to speak now or would you like to speak a little bit later? No, I won't let Wayne. I'll defer to Wayne and David and I'll talk to you in a couple minutes. Perfect. Thank you. 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 So before we, before we get to Mr. Evans, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the facility enrollment um, and how we determined um, capacity. So um, each facility, excuse me. Within each school's profile, there'll be a, 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 brief, a brief overview of uh, the facility's enrollment and maximum design capacity. Um, and Wayne will talk to you a little bit further, but there's a design capacity and there's a, and there's a maximum capacity of each facility. So part of our responsibility is to determine, um, you know, how we can most efficiently use the space in our in our schools to uh, to get the most capacity out of the schools, um, out of the space that's uh, provided in the schools. So for the purpose of this report, um, facil each facility, the the excuse me, the capacity for each facility was calculated by the following. So we use a ratio of 24 to 1 for kindergarten, 18 to 1 for first grade, and 25 to 1 for grades 2 through 12. And to establish this capacity, only regular classroom spaces, or regular uh, classroom teaching spaces in elementary and middle schools were used to determine uh, capacity. So that doesn't include special spaces, music rooms, art rooms, et cetera, um, resource rooms, only regular teaching spaces. Uh, and then high school, um, all of those spaces were used uh, to determine the capacity because uh, the enrollment, the programs are a little bit different in a high school. All right, so with that, I will ask Mr. Wayne Evans. From the, uh, the beginning, uh, what David and I have uh, tried to take and do is put together as much information as we can give you, and that's what we continue to do. 
um, about the facilities we already have. Uh, we look back at some of the facility assessments that some folks in the past had done, and uh, there were a couple of things that they did that we were doing a lot different. One thing that we recognized in what they did was they presented the district with a static report. From the day it was presented to the uh, district, the, at the accuracy of their report began to take and drop. And with the growth and developments going right on right now in Berkeley County, it doesn't take much before the accuracy in a report would take and uh, drop off very, very, very quickly. Uh, when we opened the new Boeing's Corner Schools and the Fox Bank Schools, uh, the accuracy in a report that we would have given you would have already changed. Um, anytime a new development or a new corporation moves in and, and we see growth inside the district, it's going to just continually change. Um, that was one of the one things that we tried to take and uh, consider whenever we were looking at our buildings. Um, we wanted to do it in a way that we could take and continually refine the information we gave to you. Uh, that's what you see in these uh, pictures right here. The actually levels that are in them uh, may not be where we want to see them at yet. We may be basing the information that you're looking on here from information that we'd, we'd gotten from the outside. Um, that information may have come through three or four different hands before it's gotten to us. Uh, where we find information that's not at an actual level of where we want it to be or where we think it's got to be, uh, we'll dig deeper into it. And in doing that, we've ended up having to go back to the very beginning in some areas in order to get those accuracy levels that we're looking, looking at. Um, but at any rate, what we see is we see a, a program that we want to put together that is a continual process and a continual program for our facilities. Uh, I think that's in the very best interest of the district, especially, like I say, with the growth that's going on right now. Um, what we did was we did look at each one of our buildings. We've tried to take up here in this upper area, we've given them just basically a, a, this whole sheet contains a tremendous amount of information, really. It's it's going to be what you want it to You can find the information that you want to just about uh, whatever, whatever it is that you happen to look for. The address of the schools are up in here. The year it was actually built. Um, whether or not it's had additions or not had additions. Um, this one here happens to have, and we just chose Whitesville because it's kind of in the middle of the district, and it also kind of represents some unique things that uh, we know that we're going to have questions on, so we thought we'd go ahead and throw it out there right off the bat. But uh, in here what you see is we see that uh, according to the capacity calculations that we use, the 32, uh, 32 classrooms down here, the eight first grade classroom, the 12 kindergarten classrooms, those are the designed teaching spaces. Those don't change in a school. Program space use changes. And so this is about the only stable way of evaluating our, our facilities that we know of. Um, so we've used these uh, to decide the capacities in, in our buildings the uh, and you'll look right off here and I'll go ahead and you know confront the, the question right off the bat before it's even asked but in the uh, the beginning of this right in here um, we see what the maximum maximum capacity of our buildings are based on this information and then we see our actual enrollment and that was in the around the 45 day period of, of this physical school year uh, you can look back at uh, 10 years ago and you can see the growth that's taken place in student enrollment in that school uh, that's a good information but at the same time it's not necessarily the best information uh, that school uh, say in 2010 may have been running 1300 students before another school opened and that's what we're talking about when we see information the accuracy of things changing uh, in it. And that's why it needs to be a progressive type of a uh, document or, or program. Um, what we've got here is you've got uh, 1,200 students. 1,200 students, you've got 1,200, you're 1% above capacity. That's not a lot. But the school has 10 trailers sitting out there. What we did was we went ahead and added the, the 
capacity of those trailers in, and you can see that uh, the adjusted capacity of the school would be 1,400, which would say it was, yeah, if you only run 1,200 students, it makes you ask the question, well, why do we have 10 trailers out there? Uh, the answer to that question is, quite frankly, that a lot of these classrooms are being used for programs that don't have a full complement of students. Uh, where you need these programs for certain things, uh, special ed, for instance, uh, you may only have five or six kids in the class. So you can easily fill up your rooms with special programs. Another thing that we've noticed is that um, and the construction through the years, a lot of attention's been taken and given to adding classrooms on schools. Very little attention's been given to adding storage spaces for the schools. Um, when you get a high school, for instance, and you add 10 classrooms out there and you add 25 kids in every classroom, you're adding an awful lot of books that you got to store somewhere for the kids. And as well as all the other supplies you know, in the building. So a lot of times what some of the schools have had to do out of necessity is go in there and take some of the teaching space and use it for the other things. Uh, yeah, and I'm getting rushed around. So. Uh, the uh, additions and renovations, uh, a lot of our buildings have gone through you know, renovations. That's nothing new. Everybody you know, knows that. But uh, one of the things essential to uh, understanding of buildings and are really making good decisions about them is correctly dating our buildings. And what we've done is we've gone and we've broken our buildings apart. And as far as I know, it's the first time it's ever been done in Berkeley County Schools, but we're giving you a look at our buildings um, that allows you to see where the old buildings were. Uh, it's real easy to go inside of our schools. And when you go inside the school, what you see are, you know, nice light fixtures and ceilings and carpets and everything looks all up to date. But like in this school here, that's that school was built in 1956. So this area right here, even though it was renovated, the, the sewer lines under there are still 1956 sewer lines. <coughs> Nobody tore the floor up when they did all of this. Um, the sewer lines are going to be old. The electrical pipes and things that are underneath the floor, everything under there is going to be uh, still and above the ceilings. It's still older parts of the building. While they're still usable, when it comes to a time when you get ready to add uh, a large number of uh, uh, classrooms or, or want to do a big renovation, then it's, it's information that you need to make a decision. Do we really want to keep this building, this part of this building, or we need to get rid of it? Is it starting to be a, a maintenance um, money pit that we continue to pour money into? Um, so even though that when you walk in the door, they look great, but this is a view of the buildings I don't think anybody's ever had before. But in this section, you know, you'll see uh, uh, in a lot of cases, what we've done is we've told you how many years, you know, this, this thing is, that area of the building may be, um, what, uh, 50, well, 60 something years old. Yeah, and the uh, the uh, area of the buildings that we've gone into, the square footage of our buildings, what we've done when we've broken them down, uh, we've used right here the segment numbers. What mm -hmm. we'd look for in the district was a set of numbers rather than creating a set of numbers that would uh, allow us to take and reference our buildings and so the segment numbers what they are is actually uh, uh, the insurance numbers that we have because that's uh, those are assets that don't change uh, they're going to be there you know continually so we use those and in doing that you know we've broken down the, uh, uh, the different square footages for each one of those square footage that we had what we found were that they had passed through so many people's hands through the, through the years that that information that we had wasn't good information. And it was being passed on by a lot of different people uh, that believed the information they had was, was correct. But uh, what we what David has actually done is we've had to go all the way back to the source, to the plans, and go back and look at all this information to find out for sure where the square footage is. The level of accuracy I think that we have right here in the square footage is higher than it's ever been in the district. And there's no doubt in my mind about that. But uh, over here on this side, what you see is a 
a history of the, either the construction or the renovations that this building's gone through through the years. Uh, and we've done that for each of the schools so far. What we're doing right now is going back and trying to refine and make sure the, accurate, the information that we're putting up there is accurate. Uh, the, uh, the next view that you're seeing right here is an over, overhead view. And uh, basically, it just lets you know where, these, where what you were looking at before those different segment numbers where they are in relationship you know to, to this and here you can see the age of these buildings you can start seeing the different types of roofing that's gone in here um, it uh, before the reference you know they're, they're being called segments here we're actually starting to identify what they are to give you a little better understanding of what the, what they are um, the uh, life cycle cost uh, maintenance program that we're we're going to take and uh, we're working on and going to take and launch. What it should do is it it should take and allow us to give you a facilities update anytime you want it. Um, it's a program that will uh, base the condition of our buildings on the life of the equipment and the life of the building itself the uh, lifespan of it you know everybody know well I just got through replacing my roof of my house uh, it's a, the one that came off was an 18 year you know it was 18 years old the shingle was supposed to be 20 years old but what this will do is it allow you to uh, ahead of time start realizing that we need to do some big major changes and updates and we need to get the money set aside to, to do these things, to confront them. Uh, we know there's a lot of competition for money, you know, that in the district. There's no doubt about that. And it's a small bucket of money to start with when you look at all the needs. But we can't ignore the buildings that we've got. We've got to stay on top of them. Um, can't just continue to build onto them. We've got to maintain them as well. And this this is a, a pro. A, program right now the district with the square footage that we've uncovered the district is over square over six million square feet that's just in the educational side when you add the sport buildings onto it it gets up to about 63 6.3 or 6.4 million square feet right now uh, that's an awful lot for 100 guys in maintenance to go over here and try to analyze the equipment that's in here and tell you that you need to take and consider replacing the air conditioning units on top of this building. Um, if you aren't careful, you'll end up with a situation like we had a Timberland where the equipment out there got to the end of his life cycle and then you're looking at a $4 million repair bill all of a sudden that you didn't budget for. So uh, we think this is something that uh, will definitely enhance our whole capital improvement type of uh, process, selection process. Um, what it should do is not necessarily make your choice for you, but what it should do is highlight the items in the district that somebody needs to look into so that they can take and uh, bring them to the capital improvement table for choice and decision. This is pretty much what that program kind of looks like. And I'll just kind of run through it real quick because I've spent a lot of time here. Um, it's a fact, facts-based program. It's uh, a program that, like I said, it, it's going to take the human element out of it when it comes to that. So, uh, any questions? Yeah, how, how often do you uh, check your building? Say, is this a yearly, uh, quarterly? How often do you as, give as, those update? As far as our current program or what we're... What you hoping to accomplish. What we're hoping to accomplish. Okay. What we're hoping to accomplish is to be able to provide a report on demand. Um, as Wayne said, you know, once we have this data and it's uploaded into the system, we can generate a report on any system that the board may request or any, any system that the committee may request. Um, can you run an update on... Um, all of our roofing systems in the district and uh, prioritize them, we would be able to do that uh, based on need. Run a report on HVAC systems, we can do that as well. Um, so 
the current way that we the current way that we develop our capital improvement list will basically be null and void by this process. Uh, once this system is in place, uh, we would be able to uh, develop a list uh, ranked by priority of need um, and develop our capital improvement list. Even if you rank them by priority, don't you still need to have an eyeball on the project at some point in time? Absolutely. So once the once the list is, as, as Wayne alluded to, it won't kind of takes the human element out of it but not completely so once the list is generated we would still have a set uh, we still have a, a technician go out to the site and look at whatever the system is if it's an HVAC system someone from um, HVAC will go out and assess that system to see if it actually needs to be replaced if it's a roofing system uh, someone would go out and see if it needs to be replaced as well as looking at uh, the amount of work orders if a work order has been put on that roofing system yeah, that's that's what my concern. How often would you have someone to do that? You have an idea. Well, our our technicians are out all of the time checking. Yes, sir. Every day. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we yes, have someone working here twenty four seven. Any other questions, Doctor Parker? Were you going to say something? I did have a question. So one of the things that uh, this this is brought to light, as Wayne said, the buildings. The different uh, buildings on every campus are they have insurance segment numbers and what Wayne and David have done uh, with Dion's leadership is look at these segments and and look at our insurance policies to determine whether we're insuring actual buildings that have been demolished over the last 10 years or so and whether or not we're underinsuring some other buildings. So th there really needs to be a close coordination between maintenance and our risk manager to determine whether, whether we're adequately insured or whether we're insuring uh, buildings that we shouldn't be insured, that we, don't, we no longer have. So a lot of this has come to light, and, and it's impressed upon uh, certainly Dion's department and, and these gentlemen uh, the need to have that coordination piece with finance to make sure that we're you're actually insuring things that you need to insure. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's brought a lot of information to light that we believe will enable the board to make the best decisions in moving forward and that's the real uh, goal of putting this together so that we arm the board with the information that you need to make good educated quality decisions miss Lee um, in this new program will this take into account um, the some of the facilities outside of the buildings like bleachers um, tennis courts, you know, baseball fields, things like that. Yes, ma'am. So for this example tonight, we looked at an, an elementary school, uh, probably for convenience sake. Um, but once we start getting into uh, the secondary schools, the middle schools, the high schools, yes, every component of that facility, all of the grounds uh, will be considered. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Parker, have we ensured something that we did not have? How recently? Very recently. We had, uh, and, and this is something that we discovered in going through the segments and having this, these gentlemen compare the insurance segments with what we were actually paying for. And we had, uh, there was quite a bit that there was some inaccuracies on that just needs a coordination. It's just a matter of coordinating that with the finance department and making sure that we're making the right decisions. Anybody else? Before we move to the final agenda item. <laughs> Almost uh, there. Yes. Uh, is this a software upgrade or what is? It's a new software program. <laughs> Thank you. 
keeping with the the same theme of uh, facilities master plan um, as I mentioned before eventually we're going to need um, more facilities um, so dr. Parker has well I'll let dr. Parker yeah mr. chairman and we'll make this as brief as possible but we believe that this is very important we want to share some information with you tonight on the prototype model and looking at the future of Berkeley County and determining what kind of schools you want to have here uh, we ask uh, a arch architect that I'm familiar with he's with SFLA he's a partner with SFLA principal architect and he's probably done as many prototype models in North Carolina and South Carolina as anybody I know and can t talk to you a little bit about the prototype model he's also done a great deal of research on energy efficient schools and has probably built more energy efficient schools in North Carolina and South Carolina than any other architect so I'd like to introduce him to you tonight Mr. Robbie Ferris with SFLA and let him go through his presentation which will be very brief I can look at you in the eyes and I can tell how tired you are thank you dr. Parker uh, madam chair board members um, and dr. Ingram I am Robbie Ferris uh, my job tonight was to talk to you about prototype schools uh, before I get into that, I think it's important to uh, preface the conversation with a little bit of conversation about why these schools that you're going to see tonight are so different, uh, particularly in light of the video that Dr. Ingram showed you. Uh, these, uh, some of the schools that I'm going to show you today are from Horry County. That board spent about a year looking at how teachers teach and how buildings could either support teaching and learning or not. And so out of that year-long study, research that the board and staff did came these buildings before we get into the buildings <clears throat> I'm going to just uh, briefly talk with you some about the advantages of prototypes first off uh, prototypes save time I think we all know that we can very quickly site adapt a building and and sometimes save as much as a year year and a half on a construction project reduces bid day risk if you've built the building once you know what it's going to cost so that's a very significant advantage uh, to a school district who's trying to manage their money uh, reduces the cost because subs are familiar with the prototype we've got buildings that we built 20 and 30 times so the market is very familiar with that particular building um, when when projects are built simultaneously, the project is reduced because uh, of quantity and administrative cost reductions. And I'll show you the, the schools in Horry County that we did. We built five schools at once, and they were basically the same building, and cost came weighing down. Quality went way up. Um, allows for the refinement of the end product with each iteration. So you build a building, you never get it perfect. You're, you're allowed to, you can then refine it on the next one and they progressively get better. Uh, eliminate surprises with the design again along that same idea. Makes budgeting that next project much easier. And one of the things that's not on here, but in light of the conversation about facilities, uh, standardizes materials and systems, mechanical units, wall systems, uh, all of those things become the same so it makes it much easier for your maintenance staff to maintain those items. <clears throat> So I'll go real quickly. In Horry County, we built three middle schools, an intermediate school. They were all the exact same design. And then an elementary school that was a variation on those. Uh, here you see the floor plans for the, the middle school and intermediate schools. Very simple rectangular buildings. I won't get into it a whole lot. Um, I'd, I'd like to maybe at another point, but I know you're tired tonight. Um, Here's some photographs of these buildings. Again, because they were standardized, we were able to significantly increase the quality, at least from what we typically see in the K-12 industry. Uh, very, very nice buildings. Wonderful interior spaces. Things like these glue laminated beams. You, you typically can't do that if you're doing sort of a one-off school. But when you're building five of them and they're basically the same, it makes that ordering those glue, you can order those glue lamb beams in quantity <coughs> and you can get them very economically. 
So those are some of the things, even things like glass handrails, when you're ordering the same glass handrail over and over, it actually gets very economical. That's not something we can normally get in schools, but we are able to get it here. Um, <clears throat> typical classroom here. Uh, one of the things you'll notice in this building is that the wall between the classroom and the hallway is glass. So in a typical school, that's, that's a concrete block wall. The idea here is that teachers, I mean, students don't just learn in the classroom. They also go out into these collaboration areas that you see outside that glass wall. And, and they, they learn and work in groups outside of the classroom. Uh, that's a subject that we could spend an hour on. We won't do that tonight. Um, very innovative buildings when it comes to support and teaching and learning. Tip, this is the Learning Commons, uh, otherwise often referred to as the Media Center. Uh, looking down into the gymnasium, lots of transparency, lots of natural light. Again, all of these ideas, everything in you, you see in here supports learning and teaching. So this isn't about doing pretty buildings, this is about supporting learning and teaching. There are solar panels on these buildings. The, uh, the energy cost on these buildings should be reduced by about $150,000 per school. They're all a little bit different in size, but that's significant savings um, over the life of a building. Energy cost is actually about one-third of your total cost of owning a school. So if you can eliminate that, you can eliminate one-third of the pie. Prefabricated mechanical rooms. Um, these mechanical rooms are more of an industrial grade. So they're not commercial grade. They're not what we typically put in schools. They're much higher quality, but because it's a prototype and we prefabricated these mechanical penthouses, we we're able to give the school district a superior quality building. Um, and these buildings aren't far. You could actually go see these buildings pretty easily. This is the elementary school. So that was the middle school. This is the elementary school. You can see the similarities in the floor plan. Again, these are all prototypes. Similarities in the kinds of materials and finishes. And because they're prototypes, we're able to give them a much better building than they might have otherwise gotten for the same price. This is one of those collaboration areas. These are all scattered all around these buildings. Uh, lastly, we're working on a prototype high school based on those same ideas. And so when I show you the floor plan, you'll see the similarities. Um, this is a new high school and you see in the floor plan again very similar to those other two schools but nice big open spaces and that's it any questions thank you thank you so much this time we'll move to agenda item e recommendation for naming of the stadium entrance at berkeley high school mr jackson <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, the administration received a request um, by the Berkeley High School, Berkeley High School's administration, to rename the stadium entrance um, after Dr. Jerry Brown, uh, who coached at Berkeley High School. Uh, for those of you not familiar with uh, Coach Brown, uh, he's one of the most successful football coaches in the state of South Carolina. Uh, he's won a total of five state championship titles at three different schools and three at Berkeley High School during his 18-year tenure. Also during his 18 years at Berkeley High School, uh, Dr. Brown influenced the lives of many uh, student athletes and solidified himself as one of the more uh, preeminent football minds among high school football coaches. Uh, so therefore, it's the recommendation that the committee uh, approve the naming of the player's entrance to Dr. Jerry Brown, player's entrance at the request of the school's administration. We have a motion. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to name the player entrance at Berkeley High School, Bonner Stadium, Moody Field, as the Dr. Jerry Brown's player entrance. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries three to zero. At this time, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chair. I'll second. All in favor, please respond by saying aye. Aye. Aye passes we are now adjourned <laughs>